So here we go. So Tom always says, hello, insiders. This is Ariel again. You might have uh, seen me last video, trying to get in front of the video a little bit more. And I'm uh, responsible for creators, creator products within the tech organization. When I did the video last time, I mentioned that I work with specific communities and verticals and see if we can improve things for them. I talked about uh, firearms and edgy creators and also mentioned the LGBTQ creators. One of our uh, insider nation creators, Daljot Singh, uh, said it would be nice to learn more about LGBTQ. And um, I thought that, yeah, why don't we talk about it a little bit more? And so we have the pleasure of having a conversation between me and uh, Jackson, who's going to help me communicate what we're doing and then ask me the tough, hard hitting questions and calling bullshit on me when needed. But yeah, why don't we get started? So Jackson, uh, please introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about you and YouTube. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the Creator Insider channel. Um, it's been really fun to watch the channel develop over the recent years, so it's exciting to be here. But yeah, my name is Jackson Bird. My channel is Jack is not a bird, at least currently. I, uh, I've had this channel since 2010, but I've been posting other videos on YouTube since like 2007. So you know, part part of the era where the, the brand cohesion wasn't really a priority. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, I make uh, all different types of videos over the years I have anyways, um, from Harry Potter to a cooking comedy series called Will It Waffle. But for the past five years, I've predominantly been making educational and advocacy kind of LGBTQ plus videos, um, and especially sharing my own experiences as a trans guy for the rest of the community on YouTube. You have to start out by uh, you sharing what's working well and what's not working well? Well, I think, I mean, first of all, I've got to say that it's it's very rewarding to be able to like share my story and share experiences and educate people on the platform. And that YouTube itself, especially for trans people, um, back in, you know, kind of the, the late 2000s, the earlier days of YouTube was kind of a game changer for trans representation online and us being able to share our stories on our own terms and get resources out to one another. So that's always been the side of things that's really working. Um, but I think, you know, as YouTube has grown over the years and there's a lot more people on it and the company as a business has grown, you know, there's been a number of growing pains over the years. And I think for me personally, you know, one of the biggest places I see that is, I guess in some of the harassment and, and you know, kind of like hateful comments and stuff that'll get left, those can kind of be uh, a source of the way that I choose to run my channel. You know, I have to be thinking a lot about my own privacy and my own safety, but also trying to present a welcoming and friendly space for viewers of my channel and how when there are people who come in with, you know, leaving hateful comments or trying to, you know, target me, that kind of thing can make it a lot harder to sort of foster that that friendly environment, which I think is so important because as specifically a trans creator sharing trans content and stories, a lot of people who are coming to my channel are maybe young people in a very vulnerable place, um, older people too, who are like, you know, kind of questioning their sexuality, their gender, uh, and also like parents who are confused and, and trying to find a resource. And what I would hate to see is any of those people who are new to this information, trying to get an idea of their place in the world, and they come to my channel and what do they see is a whole bunch of comments of saying that, you know, they're worthless or whatever. And so that's one of the, the things that's always really tough for me and really challenging. So I guess I would love to hear anything that YouTube is doing on that front. Yeah, so we have, and I should just echo the comment you made about uh, transgender creators and YouTube. And I've met quite a few at this point. And the key theme that always I feel uh, strongly about and the reason why I'm uh, involved with this uh, LGBTQ uh, effort within YouTube is that um, that YouTube is so important, right? That uh, it was described to me uh, as kind of life saving in in some cases. A transgender woman I met from Brazil who was getting a lot of death threats and, and found found the community and helped her. And so it's so important that we get this right. So it's specifically on the hate comment, uh, which by the way apply to many communities. And and actually that's one thing I should say also that a lot of the work that I've done um, on in these verticals and communities applies to other communities. So the, the, what we'll work on as part of the LGBTQ effort, I'm sure will apply to many other communities. And it's kind of, it, we're developing a playbook of how to improve for specific verticals. Because usually at YouTube, we build general products and then we kind of figure out where we, do we need to tune them a little bit more for specific communities or verticals, et cetera. So the point is that um, hateful comments apply to 
quite a few people, and, and but I'm well aware that in the case of uh, LGBTQ creators, it's, it's amplified. We've recently launched the um, Help for Review feature in comments. I don't know if you had a chance to play around with that feature. Yeah, a little bit. I've, I've always been a heavy user of, of filtering uh, certain words. Here's a question that might feed into um, explaining the Help for Review feature a little bit more. A particular challenge, um, probably for a, a lot of, of populations, as you said, but definitely for trans people is some of the comments that might be kind of hateful might not be using words that I could put into the filter. Is possible. Yeah, I, I should I should admit that I'm not the uh, this is not one of my teams, so I'm not the perfect expert on it. But I can tell you that the theory is exactly what you're describing, which is and you're highlighting part of the complexities we face. If you take a word without context and you make decisions on it, uh, many times it can have unintended consequences. And so uh, our systems, I think, are more sophisticated than that, and we we basically use a bunch of um, learnings from what kind of comments would probably be offensive. We've consulted with many different folks in the communities, experts, uh, creators, et cetera, and kind of built up the system to really recognize such comments. And uh, we think that it's doing uh, really well, creators who have it turned on. And I think we're now at 100%, um, but don't hold me to that. The report that they get significantly less uh, hate comments. So have you, have you tried to remove some of those words and just rely on, on the health review at all? Not yet, because I, I only noticed it in my dashboard recently. So I really, yeah, yeah. So it's, re it's re recently rolled out to 100 percent. So that's that's like a big effort that we have to really um, help on that front. When we just uh, talked previously, you also raised the issue of maybe it would be interesting for some creators to have less promotion as well. It's unintuitive because usually I hear from creators like, hey, you're not promoting me enough. But it may be cases where um, you actually want to have certain videos, probably not all videos, that go out to your community right mm -hmm. folks who maybe are your subscribers or some other um, way of identifying them but not go out to say trending if you're eligible for trending or maybe not to get overly promoted to new viewers etc so actually do you think that would be an interesting feature and then i'd love to also ask the, the insider nation to see if uh, people in the comments uh, would, uh, would think that that's actually useful uh, at all and maybe for other communities as well yeah absolutely i love you brought that up because i was actually gonna go there next and i think it's definitely got to be different every person that you talk to. Um, but I have a hunch that anyone in a kind of marginalized community might at least at times feel that way where it's sort of a catch 22 of like, of course we want our channels to grow. Of course we want our videos to be successful. But at the same time, when I have had videos that are really successful it can also be disheartening because they get this extra attention, uh, which brings with it the extra hate. And it's, okay, it's like- If you get too much distribution, you might have more hate than uh, is reasonable, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and I can I can really see it happen whenever I have a video that comes up and people suggest it. You know, if they leave autoplay on and they're just watching YouTube for an hour or so, because I'll see comments that literally say like, "Why did YouTube think I want to watch this?" Mm. Uh, and with some <laughs> some added color to that comment. Uh, and yeah, it's it can be tough. Maybe creators can uh, opt out of certain types of promotion. Maybe even for certain videos. Like maybe someone's uploading a video. It's like on the off chance this goes on trending, I don't want it on there. There is definitely a sense within the trans community and, and I would bet inside other communities as well, uh, where we're often like, oh, I wish that I could just post this video just for trans people. <laughs> and like there was some way that the computer knew that you were trans. But of course, there's no way we could ever effectively do that because you know people are all in different phases of their lives and you, you, there's no way to actually do that. But sometimes have, I try to think about, okay, we have that feeling, we have that sense you know, for our own safety, for wanting to share these stories that we maybe don't want other people to receive in the wrong way. So what could what could an actual application be from that? And maybe it is something like opting out of your video being in recommended or something. I don't know. We're spitballing. It's a new well, idea. Yeah, we're spitballing and obviously we'll have to noodle on it. It would be a very interesting feature, very unintuitive for YouTube to, to build. Yeah. So I know, you know, two big things that affected LGBT creators in recent years and I think are some of the sources of damaging a little bit of the trust in the relationship was when a lot of demonetizing happened that seemed in some cases to be targeting LGBTQ plus videos. Uh, and also when we discovered that there were a number of ads being played ahead of our videos that were sometimes for organizations that were anti-LGBTQ. And it seemed like they were specifically seeking out LGBTQ plus videos that, you know, presumably maybe people in a, a vulnerable space were watching and that they could 
get on the side of their cause, I think was a really tough thing for a lot of creators. And so I'd be curious to hear sort of your perspective and, and what you think YouTube has done since then. Yeah, so let's take uh, the two questions uh, one at a time. So first on demonetization, I should preface uh, this part of the discussion by just uh, highlighting uh, a concept that maybe is not, I think most creators understand it, but it's worth just, uh, um, just reviewing it again, which is uh, YouTube is an open platform. And being an open flat platform is actually a really hard job. Mm -hmm. it, uh, on the one hand, you want to accept all content, and we believe strongly in freedom of speech. On the other hand, there are limits. And where you draw the line is one question we always struggle with. But beyond that is a question of how do you enforce it? And um, the way we've uh, decided to enforce most of our policies is with um, uh, computer systems so that we can handle the scale. Right? We can't have humans looking at every video and for every policy, et cetera. And so when you use such systems, they have a certain amount of accuracy or, right? that's built into them and they will always have some misses and we spend a lot of time trying to tune the systems to lower the misses while still achieving the goal so as an example if we never flag any video with a yellow icon creators might be super happy um, but the advertiser dollars might dry up right so in the long term they won't be happy and so we're, we're constantly struggling with that and and the reason I, I give you that preface is it's very easy to also ascribe malintent to things that are um, tuning issues, right? And so I can assure you that we have um, non-LGBTQ videos that are getting yellow icons as well. And some creators are very cranky about their specific video that got uh, a yellow icon and could also read into it some malintent that YouTube has. Um, in my experience, there is no malintent behind it. Usually it's just like we need to tune uh, better on specific cases. Uh, and so th that's, that's how I approach these kind of discussions in general to start with. Specifically on LGBTQ, we constantly try to improve the systems uh, to make sure that we are we don't have an issue where more yellow icons are, are um, triggering for LGBTQ content. And there was also a, a creator who um, did a lot of research a few months ago that we worked with that found some flip-flopping in yellow icons. And we've since launched new versions of our systems in parallel, actually, to their work that fix the issues. Um, and so those issues now don't exist. And so there should be significantly less yellow icons for LGBTQ content. And but we're always looking to improve further. It's just the nature of, you know, you as a creator choosing to join an open platform, there's pros and cons. Other platforms work differently. Maybe you can get more certainty, but the scale is different, right? If you sign a contract and you have like a bunch of lawyers and people clearing every bit of your video, et cetera, that's not how YouTube works, right? We're, we're much more of an, we focus on, on the open platform aspect. So we do and continue to do a lot of work around the yellow icons. It was, um, we announced, um, I think a couple of months ago now that we had an issue with a lot of flip-flopping of yellow icons early in, in the early um, hours of the video being uploaded. My recommendation in general, and it certainly applies to LGBTQ creators, is um, always upload to unlisted. Keep your video not listed for an hour or two. If you get a yellow icon, you can appeal before it's public. We also have cert self-certification that's going out now, which you tell us about what's in your video. And the more accurate you are, the more our systems start trusting your declaration and will rely more and more on you. And so that's another thing that would help everybody, including LGBTQ, because as we learn that, you know, Jackson is doing a great job, we start trusting you more and more. And if our systems think there's something going on, we'll be biased to, to take your word for it instead of the, the system. So those are I kind of... Oh, so I was going to say, I actually just got a, a banner in my studio the other day saying that I'm doing a good job with self-certification. So, there you go. There right you go. So, so I think they, to answer your question, it's, it's like it's a, it's a myriad of things that we have to do. And we have to um, self-certification, um, updating our policies is another thing. We, we've updated our policies. I don't know if you had a chance to look at them, but they're like much more detailed now than they were a year ago. Um, and so trying to give you all the information so you know what's going on. Um, maybe the last thing I'll say is sometimes also with, when I talk to LGBTQ creator, there's uh, thinking that the decision about Yellow Icon was because it's LGBTQ content. And as an example, talking about sexuality is a tricky area in general, and it applies to non-LGBTQ creators. And certainly I know edgy creators who get cranky about Yellow Icons on when they talk about uh, sexuality. 
And so if I'm an LGBTQ creator and I talk about something sexual and then I get a yellow icon, I might think that it's because of it. It's, it's very easy to kind of conflate those two, but I'm not saying that everything's perfect. We continue to improve things over time and, and we work with creators like yourself to come up with interesting ideas of how can we improve further. Um, one thing that I think you've gotten a lot better at over the years is having sort of that like cultural knowledge of like what what things do come from those experiences. Um, so for a, one example, and this is sort of a, a weird example, but I've got a friend, he's a trans guy creator. He uploaded a video showing him going to pick up his testosterone prescription. And so testosterone is part of hormone replacement therapy uh, for trans people. And for us trans masculine people, it's basically steroids and we inject it with needles. And I don't think he showed himself injecting or anything, but just he was going to pick it up uh, and that video got demonetized or he might have gotten a flag on his account or something like that and i think that's one of those cases where you know a computer might see steroids and needles and be like all right yeah that we got to flag that that's not okay uh but within the context of it being like trans healthcare, that's maybe a little bit more of a gray area maybe okay and i think that's like one of those places where you can tune it as you were saying when the people tuning it have that like cultural competency to to be working from there yeah, and that, so you raise a bunch of really great points. So, so the first is that the tuning happens both at the systems level as well as the policies. So maybe that our policies aren't nuanced enough, right? Uh, I, I will say also that there's another system that we have to try to improve on, and that's um, this unlisted video review service that I think we, we reviewed on the, um, on the channel a few videos ago. And the basic idea is you submit a video in advance of publication, and we have very senior raters look at it, and they give you feedback, but we also learn what are you not understanding about our policies so we can improve our policies? Where do we have mistakes? And so we added a few LGBTQ creators as well. So we start getting that direct feedback um, that that's one more tool. And that, those are the kind of areas where maybe we could catch these kind of issues. And then again, this goes back to my point about open platform. That's kind of the trade off that we, you know, I like to think of myself as a creator and creator insider. So us as creators, <laughs> um, we have to uh, deal with, right? That sometimes you will get a yellow icon and it's okay. Uh, you know, like you you get more audience and, and you know, maybe that content actually just really resonates with the audience and you get a lot of subscribers and next video you'll monetize as well. So I always encourage creators to think also as a portfolio approach of like the whole channel and not every video has to be perfect because just as an open platform, it's, it's super hard to do. Um, the other thing I wanted to say in that context that you raised is uh, you talked about kind of sensitivities and, um, one of the things we've done is uh, added um, kind of training to all our raters uh, that talks about different communities and LGBTQ as one of them. Um, and we have an internal uh, employee group that works on LGBTQ issues and they looked at it as well. And, and the general feedback was like, it's really good. And you can imagine that it's very hard to train thousands of raters around the world with different culture, background, sensitivities, et cetera. Um, so that's another step that we're trying to really get into these um, nuances so that our raters know what's expected of them. The biggest thing I talk when I talk to creators that comes up a lot is just the notion of a, from a creator perspective, obviously you want perfection, right? You want the application of the policies to be exactly nuanced, perfect in the context of your video, right? And understanding that these shots are of this kind and not some other kind, et cetera. But operationalizing that is is difficult. And so uh, we keep trying to improve. And I, I, I know that we've improved significantly, but there's always more work to do. And that's why it's so exciting for me to talk to creators like yourself and to, to get examples of things that maybe we need to improve on when we do that constantly. So that was sort of about the, the, the yellow icon demonetization. But what about the, the ads that were playing before the videos for a while? Yeah, so um, the same policies or the concept of policies that we have for creators to get ads we have for advertisers as well. So there's a bunch of different types of advertisers who are not allowed to advertise on YouTube. And so um, there are a bunch of policies there. We're always tweaking the line and making sure that the line is correct. Um, and so in that, in those kind of cases, the, and I don't know every specific one that happened, it might've been that, uh, you know, a raider maybe approved something that they really um, shouldn't according to our policy. And it's like a quality thing that maybe we have to improve on. Um, the other thing that I tell creators is you can actually go into AdSense and there's some controls that we expose to you to say what type of ads you're willing to accept. And so you could, for example, uh, say that you, I think you have an option for like no political ads, right? Or things like that. So you can control to some degree what ads are placed, but we really rely on our policies that say like you can't have, uh, and I don't know this for a fact because I'm not as familiar with the policies on the ad side, but I'm guessing that you can't have like a really hateful ad, for example, right? So knowing that that AdSense 
you know, customization, you can turn some things on and off is really helpful. And I think even that still has some tuning. Are there any other things that you're working on? Because one thing that I have definitely learned from YouTube is there's always more that you're cooking up that we haven't heard about. So is there anything yeah, else? We, I can talk about, uh, uh, it, well, we, don't, we only have so much time. Let me, let me talk to you a little bit about um, the LGBTQ project that I mentioned in the last video and that people wanted to hear more about and maybe it would interest you as well. So um, we have uh, employee uh, resource groups. Uh, so these are employees that are interested in different areas uh, within YouTube. And we have one for um, LGBTQ, we have many others. And the LGBTQ one has a few hundred uh, employees now. So it's, it's pretty um, a big. Um, and we started a project that, uh, you know, I volunteered to help uh, Shepard um, to work on LGBTQ issues um, and figure out are the things we need to improve on, et cetera. And so um, we've been working on that now for, um, I've been involved a couple of months now. And there are like basically three work streams that we're focused on. Um, and then I can talk about any of them that interest you more or less. Um, so the first is product. And so just the kind of conversations we've had, like let's make sure that the you know yellow icon works correctly. Maybe there are ways of working, uh, enhancing it with new systems, right? Or um, the pre-review service or the like, self-certification, or maybe we can come up with other ideas that are um, uh, derived from LGBTQ work, but apply to many other communities or maybe to all creators, right? Um, so that's one issue. And that, in that context also of, of that stream is where we're noodling on this idea that you had raised of like maybe it's actually, a less promotion option could be interesting for certain types of creators that uh, they would find it um, better. Uh, the second track is a policy track. I mean, we talked about how important policies are. And you know there were recent changes that we made to policies to um, help, among others, LGBTQ when it comes to um, harassment and hate. Um, and so I think we improved there dramatically. But we want to just keep looking at uh, policies. And, and this is where folks like your, yourself will help us uh, figure out you know, where are the areas of um, potential needs to improve? Um, and I think I think you're getting a sense for how hard and complex it is to come up with policy. So that's actually another important point to just uh, reiterate. Uh, we don't make policy decisions on the fly or like, you know, overnight. These are usually multi-month efforts. And we talk to many, many uh, constituents from folks who want more to folks who want less of whatever that policy is. We look at hundreds of videos. We have, you know, many reviews that we do to come up with a policy. So it's it's tricky work, and so we just want to take a lens of LGBTQ and see, like, are there things we need to do? Um, as an example, outing somebody, okay, not okay. Like, it's not okay uh, in our right. policies, uh, but there may be other areas where related to that we want to do some more work and, and really think about it. Um, and then I mentioned also about kind of how we train the raters um, and, and make sure that they understand all the issues relating to LGBTQ. So that's kind of the second area of the policies. And then the third one is uh, communication and how we talk to the community. Cause uh, you know, I've certainly got a lot of feedback that uh, YouTube doesn't talk enough to the community in general. <laughs> and the LGBTQ community, uh, the creators that I talk to uh, reiterate that fact that we don't have enough conversations. And so here we are, <laughs> this is one of the efforts we're trying to do. Is <laughs> And we'll see if the community wants to, this kind of format or maybe there's something else we need to do. Um, we also want to make sure that when something does happen with the community, where the community is reaching out to us, that we have the right people involved in the loop, including uh, the employees who are um, part of the uh, what we call the ERG, and make sure that we have like the full context of what the issue is that the community is asking us so we can respond in a, in a positive way. Um, and like I mentioned, the, what we're trying to build here is like a playbook that can then be applied to other communities. Um, and it it'll be like a, a process that's uh, hopefully very effective at making actual changes if needed. You know, there may be areas where we discover everything's fine. Maybe all our policies are perfect and we're good. Um, <laughs> that, that would be nice, right? <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah, a little less work because that is a, a lot that you just laid out that you're working on. And so that's that's all um, sort of primarily steered by the employee res resource group, the Pride at. Yeah, so what we've done is we've used their thoughts. We've also reached out to folks in the community like yourself. And so we have a handful of creators and a handful of community um, leaders because uh, I want to make sure that we have external feedback as well. And so we're kind of coming up with a list of stuff we think we need to look into or maybe uh, work on. And uh, I think we're going through the process right now, validating it with this community that will help us. Um, and then 
once we lock that down, we just start working on them and, and cranking them out. One of my experiences working on whatever firearms, edgy creators, uh, LGBTQ, there are always learnings. I, I would say 80% of the learnings apply to the whole platform. And there's always like a 20% that's very specific. You know, mm -hmm. like for example, firearms, it's like uh, there's a big difference between a weapon and a firearm. And how do we make sure that our raiders understand that? And do we need uh, specialized uh, processes to make sure we handle those videos correctly, et cetera? So, like, that's an example where, like, hey, that's the same thing, same principle could apply to these testosterone shots, right? It, 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 right. So, there's like this learning can go between uh, the, these different communities. So, one thing that you brought up, one of the pillars or tracks was communication and wanting to be better communicating. And this video is a great first step. Um, but for a creator to. A lot, right? Sorry? Assuming I'm not blinking all the time. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll see. You know, this is a step. Is it a great step? We'll see. Okay. Uh, but, you know, for creators who are not in invited to have a conversation with you on the Creator Insider channel, like what what are ways, what is the best, like most effective way that you would say an LGBTQ plus creator could express their opinion, you know, sort of wield their power if they have a grievance or even positive feedback? You know, what's the best routes that you think personally? Yeah, there are many routes. Uh, so first off, obviously, commenting on this video, I'll be reading it. Other people will be reading it. So we aggregate. We can't respond to every comment, but we can aggregate things. We also um, can't really provide tech support, so we can't solve individuals like, hey, can you help me, blah, blah, blah. But um, certainly themes, it really influences us directly, um, what our plans are. You know, of course, we, we, there's always the social angle as well, um, which is uh, many creators are not shocked to complain uh, at us uh publicly uh although you know my preference is to find a, another way of doing it uh but uh um that's that's another uh way to do it um we also have a creator survey that goes out uh i think it's monthly now and that's an area where like we look at the comments we read the feedback um so that that's a great way to, to give us feedback kind of at scale and then lastly i would say that again because our effort here our humble effort uh has recruited a handful of both creators and community members I hope that you know you and others will be going out to the community and soliciting feedback and aggregating it up for us and then kind of holding us accountable because we'll be talking a lot and um you know you can call bullshit on us and um and you know ask us to tweak this that and the other we won't always agree but uh you know we'll have a, a good dialogue and then if that's interesting to the community we can share out you know the rationale for why we did or didn't do something uh, that might be another way to do it so i think there are a lot of different ways of communicating i guess um I find that when, uh, like working with you, for example, if we, it, you, you can be uh, obviously critical of YouTube, which is great. I love to talk to creators who um, uh, have criticism, but also be constructive, right? And so like, if we can find a solution, then help us find a solution. And that's much more helpful than just like, hey, you guys suck and not, not give any details and, you know, which happens sadly, but that doesn't really, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, awesome. I feel like I got a lot of information from you and kind of got to share a little bit of, of my insight too. So I think this was a, a good conversation, like we're saying, a good a good step along that communication path. Um, right. So thank you again for for having me on the Creator Insider channel today. Yeah, thanks for, for uh, joining. And uh, again, we'll see if the uh, audience likes it or not. And uh, maybe we'll do more of it, maybe not. But uh, in all cases, as Tom says, Jackson, keep it real. Thanks, you too. <laughs>